Okay, now that we've scratched the surface of international scandal, let's scratch the surface of international activism. Joe Corey is an anti-fracking activist in the UK, founder of the site talkfracking.org that reports on UK fracking news, creative anti-fracking activism, and promotes the idea that pro-fracking entities should hold open debates with anti-frackers to support their claims that fracking is awesome. So far, no pro-fracking takers. What makes Joe a bit unusual, though, for such a staunch activist is that he's also a celebrity. Joe is an entrepreneur and designer, the co-founder of Agent Provocateur. He is also the son of fashion designer and fellow environmentalist Vivian Westwood. Further distancing himself from your typical run-of-the-mill celebrity that feels politics aren't chic and selfies are the best, Joe uses his own create creativity and media skills to combat not only fracking, but the whole crooked, capitalist, corporatized, fucked up system. Take a look. In the US, you've uh, led the world in fracking. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but um, certainly I think for, for this administration and the one before it, um, they saw... Uh, fracking and shale gas as being a, a big boom industry that would help the economy. And, um, and they, they liked what they saw in the US. Um, and then what they did is they had a lot of meetings with um, US companies, people like Halliburton and stuff over here, um, and looked at the legislation that needed to change in order to um, give a smooth ride for the frackers. And then they slowly have set about changing all the legislation, reducing the regulation, um, spinning all kinds of PR stories about how they're doing the opposite of what they're actually doing. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a long, hard battle. Um, and we know, we're nowhere near over it yet. Um, because of all of the success that local people have had um, in overturning uh, planning permissions and stuff for test drilling and, and fracking um, permits, um, the government has now, uh, is now in the position where they are having to overrule uh, local democracy in order to push these things through. And that's a very dodgy game um, because the current administration that we have in office do not have a very large majority in the House of Commons. They only have about 10 or 11 people as a majority. And some of those conservative people are, um, are anti-fracking. Um, you know, their constituencies are, right, slam in the middle of uh, these apparently vast reserves of, uh, of gas um, from the fracking industry. And people are very concerned about that. You founded the site Talk Fracking, which combines sort of these these very factual aspects uh, and stories from the front lines of affected communities, like you mentioned, and it also displays uh, creative activism. And I know that you yourself are, are are a creative. So talk a little bit about the role of fashion, music, and art in activism, and why you feel that it plays an important role. Well, I think what what I've found along the way. Um, you know, when I when I really decided something had to be done, what I, what I did was actually go out and employ one of these uh, PR firms that the enemy employs, the fracking industry employs. You know, so I thought, well, I'll play them at their own game. You know, we'll go out and employ one of those guys, and you know, we'll put the counter argument out in in the media. And I played that game for a while, and what I discovered was that actually pretty much uh, the mainstream media, that's everything from the Times newspaper right through to the BBC and all, all the rest of it, pretty much the majority of their stories are not news stories at all. They are placements put there by PR industries working on behalf of industry. And so what I found out is that the really most effective way to uh, get into the media and get your voice across was to start to be a bit outrageous. You know, we had to start doing stunts that were a bit ridiculous. You know, I don't know, we took a box... That, we, we had a, a report, for example, that came out where, where um, one of the, the government's chief scientific advisers had compared um, 
the potential of fracking in the UK, uh, saying it could end up being one of these things as adverse as asbestos or thalidomide um, in the future, and that it could cause, it, you know, it, it had the potential to cause a hell of a lot of damage, um, and that we should be, we should tread extremely carefully. So we took a box of asbestos to David Cameron's house for Christmas. Um, it wasn't real asbestos, a load of cotton wool or whatever. But, you know, we had to start doing those things because that was the thing that would get us media attention. Uh, another thing we did is we drove a tank to his house and, um, you know, parked on his lawn and with all, all the nanas or grandmas from the north of England that have run one of the most successful um, campaigns to date. Um, because they're looking after their grandkids, you know, and uh, and you can't argue with a grandma looking after her grandkids. You just got to shut up and take it, right? And I guess I don't know. I've had a bit of a baptism of fire in understanding how this uh, supposed democracy of ours actually works. And I can tell you, it's frightening. It's frightening. These people are out of control, behaving totally irresponsibly, if not criminally. And um, I don't know, I just, I just encourage everybody to just stand up against it. You know, it's up to us to take responsibility for it in the end. I know it's really hard sometimes and everyone's got other stuff they've got to do and everything. But if we don't protect our environment and our habitat, where are we going to live? Um, so I do, I do want to talk about the, you know, the Green Party in England. And we've had Jill Stein, who's the... the the Green Party presidential candidate here on the show. Um, we've had this discussion about the idea of occupying uh, government, because here, you know, in the Occupy movement and a lot of other movements as well, it's this idea of, like, anti-establishment to such an extent that you never align yourself with any party. And um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on this, because you've, you've written about aligning yourself with the Green Party, but you also have this very strong anti-establishment streak. Talk about the, the combination of politics in terms of government and politics in terms of street protest and anti-establishment. You have to deal with what you've got in front of you. And I think, you know, I grew up in, a, in an age where we were all uh, interested in the ideas of punk rock and anarchy and uh, we didn't want the establishment and we wanted to get rid of the queen and we want to get rid of the government and I think you know you've got you know Green Party or not I, I've tried to work with the Green Party and you know bless them I love Caroline Lucas she's the one Green MP that we've got she does some really good stuff but actually the rest of the Green Party are pissing around I don't know what they're doing you just you couldn't trust them to organise anything. I think the biggest hope, actually, personally at the moment, that we have here is probably Jeremy Corbyn from the Labour Party. Just because he's actually what Labour was always about. And, um, and he has a, a track record of sticking by his principles and, um, and, and really, you know, fighting on behalf of people, not on behalf of corporations. So finally, I just want to I, I just want to ask what what is next not only for your own endeavors but what do you feel is next for the fracking and perhaps even the environmental movement as a whole? Like, how do we keep pushing the uh, the capitalist system away from this endless extraction? I have to say, I think I think I've got a really strong feeling that fracking is dead in the water in the UK. If it's dead in the water in the UK, it's dead in the water everywhere else that's thinking about doing it. Not in the US, because unfortunately you have a system out there where these people can just go and do all this stuff without ever kind of having to pay for it or, or having to answer for it. And I, I feel you have them, some of the most beautiful landscapes on the planet in the United States of America. And you, I'm sorry, but you guys over there have let these people shit all over them. And... Um, I don't know, they need to be made to pay for it. But I think in, in the UK, we're going to carry on. If they, if they have a government minister now override the local planning decision, all that's going to mean is that every other um, place where, where people are tracking people are going to be demonstrating more. They're going to be there on the street. They're going to be tying themselves to the trucks. They're going to be not wanting to 
live there. They're going to be trying to sell their homes. It, it, it's going to turn into a very quick spiral that people are going to just say, we don't want this thing here. We don't need it. We don't want it. And that's the key thing is we don't need it. We don't need the gas. You have to understand when I started this um, campaign, I mean, my, my initial um, drive was to say this isn't really about anti-fracking. This is about pro-democracy. All we've heard is about, uh, you know, the positive effects of fracking and stuff. And actually what we'd like is a real debate. You know, we would like the fracking industry to put forward their best speakers. We will find matching speakers. We're going to tour around the country. We're going to rent halls and places. We're going to leaflet before we go there. We're going to put uh, advertising in local newspapers. We're going to push it all out over the Internet. And we're going to invite people to come to a real debate. Not one of the people from the fracking industry would stand up and come and debate with us. We ended up having all these, uh, all these gigs where we only had one panel, you know. And, and in the end, people kind of noticed and they went, why won't these people turn up and talk about it? Because they know they're going to lose. And so, and so they won't even t turn up. And then you get them on the run a bit and they don't know what to do, you know. Timing is everything. And if you're able to identify the door, identify the window that you can go through in that timing, you can be very uh, cost effective at creating something massive, you know, and uh, that's media manipulation. And I guess you've got to play them at their game, but it's a very tough game to do. And I think probably tougher in the, in the United States than it is over here, um, just simply because of the geographical size of where you are and how many people and, languages and you know i don't know it's a tough game but i guess if you're right in your head and you know you're kind of doing the right thing and you can see what you know what you're fighting against is causing so much damage and destruction you'll just keep on doing it Unfortunately, this is but a portion of, what, of our more than 40-minute interview, so please, not for my sake, but for your own, check out the full unabridged version on our YouTube page. We will, of course, also be uploading it to our Facebook page and tweeting it out.